of pressing urgency? Five hindrances. Five hindrances, are they pressingly urgent, are they? <laughs> 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 it's a bit self-revealing there. Anyway, uh, that's very good. Oh, there was, I remember I heard a story once when there was a, a certain, certain monk was living at a um, <coughs> meditation monastery in Burma. And, uh, and the, the people came around and, and came to see him and been there for a long time and so on. And they said, oh, you've been here practicing meditation what, what have you attained in all this time? He said, well, I've managed to attain the five hindrances. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's something anyway. Yeah. Better than nothing? Well, perhaps not better than nothing. Okay, five hindrances. Yes, it's very important. Five, you have to make, be very friendly to your five hindrances because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. You know? And uh, most of us... Uh, are very intimate with our five hindrances, we live closely with them and uh, from the day that we're born till the day that we die, in fact, you know, closer to us than our mother and father, our brothers and sisters, you know, closer to us than our children, you know, the five hindrances, every waking moment of our life, not to mention the sleeping ones as well. <laughs> It's a bit depressing if you think about it, you know, you think you can, you can actually be born and live your whole life without ever really knowing what it's like to be free of the hindrances. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Not only is that possible, it's actually normal. And actually, most people actually never really know what it's like to be free of the five hindrances. And the best for most of us, not everyone, but the best for most of us, you know, we know sort of states of relative freedom, relative peace from it. Yeah? And, and, and we, those things, we probably, most of us or all of us have had, you know, times when the hindrances are very, sort of very quiet, are very, very weak in the mind. Yeah? And so we, we, we remember those moments, say, uh, as a moment of, of great peace or a great joy. Uh, we remember like a time... You know, just thinking back to my, my time before I was a monk and certain, certain occasions, like, I remember sometimes, like, sort of lying down on the, when I was a kid and lying down on the, on the back lawn and, and looking up at the, star, at the sky and just sort of looking at the stars and wondering about them. You know, you have this sort of great sort of sense of, of being awake and, and, and wondering and open. And there's a great sort of peaceful sense of joy about it. So there's those moments where the hindrances are, are, are quiet, yeah, they're not they're not very powerful, but still, they're not completely overcome by any means. And so, uh, so this is why it is important that we have a good relationship with our hindrances. Yeah, I mean it's like having having uh, bad neighbours. You know, I mean they may be there drunkards and obnoxious and annoying and everything, but you know you don't want to make it worse than it has to be. Yeah, <laughs> they still live there. So it's the same thing with your hindrances, is as bad as they are, well, they're still part of you, and they're still deserving of compassion. <coughs> and so you, you don't, um, we don't uh, make things worse by feeling alienated from our hindrances, right? That is what makes it worse, because then you, there's a sense of denial, it's like cutting off, and you don't make it worse by pretending that you don't have them, yeah? Or by you know by by um, <clears throat> uh, by pretending that it doesn't matter or something like that. So the Buddhist approach is to embrace these things, to understand them, to know them. The Buddha said parinyaya, yeah, to know fully th all the way through, yeah, to know something all the way through and all the way round. So this is an approach to the hindrances. So what are the hindrances? First one is uh, sensual desire, ill will self and torpor, uh, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. There's five um, uh, qualities which uh, uh, arise in the mind. And the Buddha said that these five things in particular are the main things which obstruct meditation, and he called them dubali, uh, panya dubali karane dhamma, is the, the dhammas or the qualities which weaken and obstruct wisdom. Okay, so if we want to give rise to wisdom, we have to learn how to overcome these things. 
So I'll talk a little bit about each one uh, in turn. Uh, first one is sensual desire, karma chanda, and uh, also uh, abhijja. And so basically this means any kind of uh, uh, attachment or attraction to some kind of pleasurable experience which we have through the <coughs> five senses or uh, like memories and expectations of those experiences as well. And so sensual desire is not by no means limited to sexual desire. That's, that's part of it. Uh, desire, obvious things like desire for food and so on is part of it. Uh, desire for comfort. Uh, physical comfort and so on, desire to see beautiful things, hear lovely things and so on. All of these fall under this uh, thing of sensual desire. Now, uh, so that's very, that's a very kind of challenging teaching right away. Yeah? And we can all think of something. We might think, okay, well we're ready to give up one thing or another thing, but we can all think of something. Maybe it's perfume. Yeah? <laughs> Is that hard to give up? Now, for me, that's not such a big deal, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Giving up perfume was never a big problem in my spiritual practice, yeah? And, uh, but for other people, that's very hard, yeah? Uh, for me, you know, giving up music and playing guitars was, was, was much more difficult, yeah? And so that was my thing, or one of my things. I mean, I have many things, I can make a whole list of my things if I wanted to. <laughs> That's kind of one of them. So we've all got our thing, but it's all kind of some variation on that 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 aspect of of, uh, of attraction, the law of attraction, the law of design, and and the, the basic thing about Buddhism is not that these things are in themselves inherently wrong or sinful or anything like that, but that they they pull the mind. This is the basic problem, is it pulls the mind out from its centre and pulls the mind out into the world and stops the mind from being still. Okay? So, uh, what the Buddha said about greed or about desire as a defilement, he said is uh, uh, little, uh, of, li uh, of, of little harm, relatively speaking, of little harm, uh, but very difficult to overcome. Yeah? So it's not, it's, not, it's not something which in itself is inherently very harmful or very dangerous, but it is very hard to overcome. As opposed, for example, to hatred, which he said is of great harm, but is relatively easy to overcome. Yeah? And delusion is of great harm and very difficult to overcome. Yeah? <laughs> That's a really, a really hard one. So, sensual desire, so it's something which we need to uh, uh, work with gradually. Now, you know, we, 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 to, 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 to sort of dramatize the issue or dramatize the problem, you know, you, you say, well, you take it to, you say, well, what if, what if we didn't know any restraint in sensual design? Yeah? Well, and we look at what, what are the results of that. And we can see what is the results of that. We can see all around us, drug addiction, the rampant materialism, and all of these kinds of things. Yeah? So, it's, it's, it's quite obvious, even, even not even from a, from a Buddhist point of view or even a particularly spiritual point of view, but just from a, an ordinary common sense human point of view. Uh, you know, things like, say, adultery and so on, these things which, which cause so much problem, you know, because of not knowing restraint and not knowing your limits, and these things that cause so much suffering. <coughs> so, even just from an ordinary common sense point of view, there's some wisdom in knowing restraints and knowing limits. Yeah, around our desires and our wishes. And that's one of the things that we learn when we grow up, isn't it? You know, when we're kids, we sort of think, I want, eh, gimme, 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 yeah? And, and you think, because I want it, somehow I should get it. And when you grow up, you become an adult, that's one of the things you learn, is that there's a gap between wanting and having things, and what you can expect, and so on. And getting what you want all the time isn't always good for you. That's what mummy told us. If you eat all those sweets, you're going to get sick. And we said, we know better than mummy. We ate all the sweets and we got sick. Well, I did anyway. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay. Mummy was right that time. But being, being of an inquisitive and inquiring mind, I thought, I've got to keep testing this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this once isn't enough. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
after ex ex exhaustive testing, finally you can con <laughs> conclude, <laughs> yes, it's true. A couple of sweets, it's not a problem. Yeah? And then uh, too much makes you sick. So this is basically the principle. And so it's not uh, you know, overcoming this, this particular hindrance. It's not a matter of you know, pursuing uh, uh, great uh, ascetic practices or, or, or you know, being, you know, depriving yourself or anything like that. But it's essentially a practice of knowing moderation okay? and of knowing the limitations of things. And the, 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 your success in this area <coughs> is not going to come through anything special, but it's going to come through your consistency in how you apply that. Okay? So, for example, uh, you just, and one of the things that it always is, encourages is to reflect. Okay? So whenever, uh, whenever you, you get anything good, right, then just to reflect about it. You reflect on, okay, it's just that much. You have, a, you have a nice piece of cake, you say, okay, well, it's just that much. You have a nice cup of coffee, well, it's just that much. And you buy some new clothes. You reflect when you get them, well, now this, 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 this new dress or this new shirt is really nice and, and so on. And then I'm going to wear it once and it's going to be dirty and smelly. Yeah? And I'm going to have to wash it. Yeah? That's, that's just the reality of it. And so if we reflect like this, regularly, constantly, yeah, then we... We, we get a sense of coolness around these things. We're not so we're not so obsessed with them. You know? You're not so you're not so caught up in it. And it's just it's the consistency with which we do that that is really the key. Yeah? It's not doing anything special. It's just that reflecting. Oh, okay. It's just that much. Not getting caught up in the shininess of things. Yeah? In the newness of things. Yeah? Just reflect. Oh, okay. It's just that much. And these things can only give um, the, the, the pleasure or the gratification which is within their own nature. Okay? So they have a certain nature and they can, you can get a certain satisfaction from them within that, but they can't transcend that and they can't go beyond that. And they can't really touch yeah? the core of who you are and they can't really make you happy. So. This is a, a, a sensual design. So, uh, the most important and the most important practice here is restraint and reflection on that. Uh, with the next uh, hindrance, hindrance is ill will or anger. It's like the complement. And of course, these two very often go together, and sometimes in very obvious forms. Like, so for example, jealousy. Yeah? So you know, you, you're in a relationship with somebody and if they go and see somebody else or something then you get tremendous anger towards them. Okay? So you can see that these things uh, often have a pair. And uh, uh, also, for example, in uh, the case of war, yeah? so you, you know, in violence in, in society is because basically people want things. Yeah? You want land or you want the oil or you want whatever. And, and then so you have to rouse up all this anger and violence and so on to get what you want. So these, these two often go as a pair, have to be worked on together. So as I mentioned before, the Buddha said, anger is greatly blameworthy, but relatively easy to overcome. Okay? That doesn't mean it's all that easy to overcome, just rel <laughs> relatively easy to overcome. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's unpleasant. Yeah? Anger feels bad. Yeah? When you think angry thoughts and you, 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 you pursue... That, that goes kind of ruts of, of, um, of uh, negative thinking and stressful thinking and all of those things, then it feels bad, it feels unpleasant. And so you, you're strongly motivated to overcome that. And when you do overcome it, yeah, uh, it, feels, it feels good. You get like an instant sense of satisfaction, instant feedback. You understand straight away when you can abandon an angry mood. It can happen quite quickly. You abandon it and you feel so good afterwards. Yeah? So this is, that's, that's and ref again, reflecting on that process helps you in that. Now one of the, the um, uh, things which is useful uh, for uh, anger, I mean it's useful for all of these things, but useful especially for anger is, is very good. Is, is to reflect on the, the, the nature of uh, the nature of the habits of the mind that we tend to make. 
We did a, it was doing a, a, a psychology uh, course on the, on the weekend, and they were giving some, uh, showing some, uh, some, uh, inf giving some information on the this this thing of the the, uh, the like the pathways which your your neurons are forming in your brain. Yeah? And so this is something that's a very, you know, very handy way to reflect about it. Like each time you think a certain thought, then the kind of your brain fires in a certain way. So you get this kind of net of, of neurons and so on which all kind of join up and which all fire in a certain way and the more which you you do that you think in that way the more the neurons will grow in that particular direction yeah? so they use the the, um, uh, uh, the, the the slogan they say the neurons that fire together wire together right? so the more they go that way the more they will grow in that way so each time you think in that particular way you're promoting those particular pathways and those other pathways are decaying. Yeah? So every time you think thoughts of anger, right, you're, promo you're making it easier to think the next thought of anger and making it harder to think a thought of loving kindness. Yeah? This is I mean, the term they use for that in, in the Abhidhamma. Uh, they use this term asevanapachaya. It's like a particular kind of conditional relationship where you one thing conditions something else of the same character. Okay? So you, you keep on thinking thoughts of anger and makes it easier and easier and easier and easier and easier to go down that way. Yeah? And I think we all know what that's like. Yeah? We all know what it's like when you, know, you do something bad, right? And you do something and, and, and you feel it's really guilty about it and stuff, you know? And then next time you do it, it's not quite as bad as it was the first time. <laughs> and the third time and the fourth time it becomes very easy actually. You think, what was I worrying about? Yeah? <laughs> So again, this is our seven apache. You know, you keep on doing it. So uh, the good part about it is you can stop, right? And if you stop thinking those negative thoughts and those negative kinds of emotions, then those neurons will atrophy. They'll, they'll gradually fade away, and you and you positively direct your mind to think thoughts of love and kindness, thoughts of forgiveness. <coughs> then uh, those ones will grow, and you'll move in that direction. So that's good. That means you can, we can do something about that. Uh, so when we have that angry feeling that comes in, yeah, the best I, th I find the best thing to do is to first of all to to um, you know, to rec if you recognize it quickly, yeah, then uh, it's much easier. Yeah? Once you get caught up in it, it's much more difficult to recognize it quickly. It's your mindfulness, yeah? and then. You cut off the thought. So this is something you actively do with your mind. It's like a kind of cognitive thing. You stop that thinking and the negative thinking, and then you point, point the mind in the positive direction. Yeah? And you keep on doing that persistently. But the other thing that you can do is also reflect inside yourself and ask yourself, what does this anger feel like? Yeah? And then just feel the, what it's like inside your body to have that. Yeah? And, you, and you, you feel the kind of the burning and the constriction, and it's... It's just a horrible feeling, yeah? and then you, you and just remind yourself, I've done this to me, right? <laughs> I'm the one doing this to me. That other person's not doing it to me, yeah. It's not this traffic jam doing it to me, yeah. <laughs> it's it's not the it's not my boss doing it to me, yeah. It's me doing it to me, yeah? and it's completely it's got it doesn't serve any purpose at all, yeah. It doesn't serve any purpose. So again, we we were learning in the in, in the psychology course about that. that you know, maybe these things have a kind of biological function, so they kind of that you know you pump up your adrenaline and so on, so you get ready to fight and flight and all of those kinds of things. And of course, it becomes completely dysfunctional you know, when you you can't respond in that way. And so it's why this is always feeling of tra being trapped and despairing kind of feeling. You, you're filled with this this anxiety and and anger and so on. And what can you do about it? There's nothing. That you, it doesn't go anywhere. And then it just erupts in this kind of irrational uh, behavior. So, first of all, to be aware of it, then to, 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 to direct your mind in a wholesome way, cut the thought off, direct your mind in a wholesome way, and to reflect back on the feeling and know what the feeling, like, the feeling is like. When the feeling is relatively under control uh, and relatively quiet, then uh, you develop metta. Okay? But don't try to develop metta 
when you're in the throes of rage. All right. Okay, so don't sort of try to sort of maybe be happy right, when you kind of got this. It doesn't work, yeah? It just creates a, like a tension in the mind. Yeah? It's, it's too much. You're trying to force yourself against the stream too much. And the metta will become very insincere. So you need to you do you get your mind to a state of relative okayness. Okay? It doesn't have to be completely okay, but just generally being okay first. Okay, just using your mindfulness and other techniques, and then uh, can develop the um, uh, develop the metta. So, next one is is uh, sloth and they translate as sloth and torpor. I think Bhikkhu Bodhi. It's a bit of a weird translation. Bhikkhu Bodhi, I think, has changed it in his recent translations to um, lethargy and drowsiness, if I, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. So basically, it's uh, lack of energy, sleepiness in the mind. That's so funny. Well, it's like a sloth, you yeah. know. It's, it's so exaggerated uh-huh. as a translation because um, literally for, you know, for us, what, it meant, what that means is to be lying on the floor without being able to move. Uh-huh, yeah. So if you relate it to the animal that does uh, hardly move, yeah, yeah. it's got this connotation in society of being the laziest animal on the planet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And to, to say, okay, so your sloth is a hindrance. Mm. No one, I mean, not no one, but generally speaking, you don't think, oh, you know, I'm sloth, I am sloth, you know. <laughs> well, speak for yourself. Uh, well, I, mean, I, I, I feel like that quite often. A bit extreme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe you know. I think that's probably quite true, yeah. I guess that's why Bhikkhu Bodhi is probably... It's been a classic translation for many years. That's time to freshen it up a bit. Maybe the translators have been too lazy <laughs> <laughs> to change it again. They'd be too soft. Or... But I'll tell you what, I mean, the interesting thing is that when you start to meditate is that you actually do become like a three-toed sloth. <laughs> don't you? It's quite extraordinary. And you think, well, here am I doing this to awaken, right? And... You experience states of tiredness which are extraordinarily more powerful than, than anything else, you know? And, um, you know, sometimes it can be very, very strong, right? So you can get the you can get incredibly intense uh, feeling. And, and, and for me, it's a, it, feels, it feels like this kind of black cloud which is, which is like, um, like, like descending on your head and, and squeezing your brain. Have you ever had that one? It sort of sc- sc- crushes, crushes your brain in like this kind of, this kind of thing. No? Maybe it's just me. This is one, and, and, and the diff- they have manifest in different ways. I mean, sometimes it's just like a dullness or just a lack of lack of awareness. Yeah, what's happening? Uh, sometimes then there's the really tricky one, which is where where there's like a, a sloth or a sloth, I'm sorry, a lethargy. Is that better? Is lethargy better? Or laziness. Laziness. Yeah, yeah laziness, yeah. sleepiness, tiredness, whatever. Is, is associated with delusion. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the main thing it's associated with. So what it does is when you're sitting, and this one will come up very, very often, when you're sitting it says, it's all right. You can have a little... <laughs> Just lie down, it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little one. Yeah. And 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 what's what's extraordinary about that is is how um, small that voice is. Yeah, it's not it's not a big or dramatic thing. It's very very small, and yet extremely persuasive. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, comes into your mind and says, oh, there's a little bit of a lie down. You'll be able to meditate very, I think, better when you're lying down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you really deserve it. You've been working hard. Well, you haven't been working that hard, but you deserve it anyway. And, and uh, so, yeah, that one is, is uh, very tricky. So this is the voice of delusion. And it's, it's very interesting to, to, to do the practice of... of not sleeping, and then you, you learn 
a lot about these these states of delusion, which you see. And we did this um, uh, all night set at, at uh, Santi a few weeks ago, where we sat for 12 hours, from 6 till 6. Mm. And, um, yeah, by the third quarter of the night, yeah, by the third watch of the night, you're kind of, yeah, you're investigating those states of delusion with quite some intensity, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> And you really see this is what this is kind of mind, just this cognitive dysfunction, just things not working, things not coming together. There's the mind is just creepy. It's just this weird stuff happening in these different ways. And you can so you're actually starting to to investigate to see that quite a lot. So this problem of, of lethargy, I think one of the uh, 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 problems that we have. Um, is simply that we're, uh, and this is what I experience a lot with, with people in, uh, in, uh, these days, is, 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 is I think we're just overwrought a lot of the time because of, of just um, the stimulus of, of modern life, you know, buzzes and beeps and traffic and everything. And I think our, our, our physicality and our body and that just gets overwrought and overtired. And so you, you find that a lot when people go on retreats is the first few days on retreat is people, do, you just need to sleep, mm-hmm. and and people just can't just can't stay awake and that you know when you get into this thing. So I, I think actually, you know, like if you're going to do a ten day retreat, you really need to sort of sleep for a week beforehand, mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, and then you know after usually you know, even not a week, even like three or four days, most people see, you seem to recover. But you, very often that's what you find on retreats is people come to the retreat with the best of intention, they really want to go for it. Just they're just exhausted, and this just seems to be a very kind of deep level cellular exhaustion, and and you just have a few days trying to do some meditation and rest, and then you know generally you're okay after after maybe three or four days, and the energy levels start to come back. So I, I kind of suspect that that's that's just a, a sort of uh, sort of a measure of the the stress of of, uh, of life and the busyness of life. So. Uh, to, to help with uh, overcoming lethargy or le- lethargy and drowsiness, um, there are some practical things that we can do. Again, uh, you know, all of the, the, the sensible things right, are good. Getting some exercise every day, having a good diet, you know, being a healthy body, all of those kinds of things are all uh, good. Um, uh, not overworking, getting, getting enough sleep. All of those things, but in your meditation specifically, now you find that some people will will tend to really fall asleep a lot in their meditation. Yeah, so just as soon as they sit, they sort of start to nod and these kinds of things. So this is uh, can be a terrible problem for some people. Yeah, and uh, I know some monks who just struggle with that desperately. Yeah. Uh, and often it's people who are very uh, tend to be very active in their mind, and so like even people who have like ADHD or something like that, um, uh, and and uh, what was it ADHD, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, ADD, whatever. Um, I knew one monk in Thailand who had a terrible problem with nodding. He used to nod every time he would sit, with complete regularity. One time. Uh, we were sitting and we were doing this retreat and we'd sit uh, in the, we, at midday and so you'd have like a heavy kind of meal of sticky rice in the morning and then it's like 11 o'clock we'd come and we'd do an hour's sit and everybody was nodding in the middle of the hot day in Thailand. Everybody was nodding and I was trying to force myself not, not to nod by, 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 by keeping my eyes open. So I abandoned all hope of actually doing any meditation, but at least <laughs> trying to, at least trying to keep my eyes open, and then this kind of <laughs> occasional kind of finger help to sort of keep it going. And and you can see everyone in the room's nodding. And then this one poor monk was was nodding. I, he act, I actually saw him actually physically make contact with the floor. <laughs> His, it, <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, and he's kind of he's, he's sort of he was he was he was round and round and round and then and then finally, boom, he hit the floor. <laughs> Woke him up for a few seconds and then uh, and then he's back into the rhythm. And 
Yeah, and he, he had such a problem, he went to stay at this monastery where this, the, the monk there had, was, had this kind of reputation for really training his monks to overcome this. And they had all these very, very strict rules in that monastery to stop you, because, you know, they get up like 3 o'clock and the first meditation's at 3.30. And the, all the monks had to sit with matchboxes on their heads <coughs> at 3.30 in the morning, right? And if the matchbox, matchboxes on your head... With matches in them. With matches in them, yeah. And if the matchbox fell off once, then you were only allowed to have uh, like uh, just sticky rice with, with just like one simple curry on it, okay, one simple vegetable dish. And if it fell off twice, then you couldn't eat at all. all right? So it's using the first hindrance to combat the third. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This is like this is like jujitsu kind of hindrance jujitsu. Yeah. You use the first hindrance to overcome the second. And. Uh, so, yeah, so this is what they do. They all go there and, and they've you know, got like 20 monks sitting in a room with mad foxes on there. <laughs> and so he did that. And then he came back to stay at the monastery we were at and I saw him after that. And he'd be sitting, he'd be sitting there in the morning in the meeting and he'd, be, and he'd put his matchbox on his head. And he'd be like... Oh. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hindrances, they have it, they, they find a way. Uh, all these kinds of things. So, some people would meditate, put your hands up like that, that's another way of doing it. So, it might think of all of these ways of doing this, or sitting on the edge of a cliff is another way. Yeah. Yeah. So, the ones who died never came back to the Well, exactly, yeah. Only the successful ones that lived to tell the story. Uh, so, um, all of those things are good, but uh, uh, open air is good, a uh, fresh, energizing place. You know, like you know that some, pe some places like, uh, tend to be very kind of closed, the air doesn't move very much and so on, and they tend to, they, those places are good for stilling the mind, whereas other places are like really open, and say, say like at Santi Monastery, you know, our, 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 our huts which are on the cliffs, for example, like they're like really high energy, and the air is always moving past them and so on, so those places are good for, for keeping awake. So, Sometimes if you can use the place that you're in to balance your, your faculties, also is good. Um, and it's also one thing that's useful if you need to open your eyes, is useful. And if you, if you have a, like a, a light, a candle or something in the room, and, and you can just watch the light or watch the candle while you're meditating, and that can help. Uh, and one of, or you can develop a perception of light, like that's on a more subtle level, but you can actually like develop the image of a light within yourself, and that can also help to overcome the the uh, 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 hardness. Uh, but also, one of the important things is hmm, a couple of other important things. One is uh, 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 an evenness and um, persistence in how you approach your meditation object. Okay, so that means not just drifting through your meditation, but actually from the beginning. Applying yourself to your meditation with a bit of rigor, okay? A little bit of putting a little bit of energy into actually placing your mind onto the breath or onto the meditation object, and doing that before you start to get tired, okay? If once you once you got tired already, then it's too late. You know? So that's important to do that before, and developing a positive perception around your meditation, so that you you try to manage yourself. I realize it's it's not always easy, but as best you can. Try to manage it so that you meditate at a time when your mind is clear. Yeah? And the more you can do that, the more you develop an association that meditation is a, is a clear time, a time of clarity. And so that will, that will really help a lot. So one of the things that you'll notice in your meditation, and uh, certainly this is, this is what I find in my meditation, is that, that when you, know, you start and the mind's kind of active or so on, and then gradually it settles down. And so... And, 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 and it, but it kind of settles down too much, yeah? and so it tends to go down. Well, I find almost always in meditation it sort of goes down after 20 minutes or half an hour, and then it sort of gets too tired, and then it sort of gradually works its way back, yeah? and then sort of comes, comes good after that. And so some, partly that's a natural cycle. Yeah? Now if you can recognize that as a natural cycle, then you don't have to worry about it too much. Okay, that's just the mind and the body adjusting itself and coming into balance. Yeah, so that's that. You just have to be patient. So that's not really a problem as such. Yeah, 
but the problem really is the, is the ones which is where it goes down and then just sort of keeps on going, yeah? And you completely lose your mindfulness or whatever. So, so just to learn that difference. And if you just keep your, if, if you, when the mind gets tired and energy goes out, if you just keep minimal level of mindfulness there, yeah? Not necessarily doing very much, but just being patient, and then often you'll find that the mind will sort of work its way back uh, to clarity in its own good time. So that's sometimes just patience. So this is uh, Sloth and Torpor. So the next one is uh, what do you call restlessness and worry. And uh, really this is, this is kind of the, basically this is mind running off to the past and the future. Okay, so restlessness is running off to the future. Worry is worrying about, is, 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 is going back to the past. Okay, so this is kind of orientation of these things. And the, the word we translate as worry in, in the Pali word is literally is kukucha, which means uh, uh, bad doneness. It's a literal, literal rending of it. Okay, so it means worrying about or concern about things that you've done or not done and so on in the past. So, okay, so, so past acts and things coming back to haunt you. Okay, so feelings of remorse or guilt coming back to get you or, or, or about things which maybe you haven't done or, or whatever and so on. So you're going back and dredging up the past okay, and bringing it into the present to haunt you. And Uddhacca is the opposite. So Uddhacca is the mind running off into the future, making plans, uh, fears about the future, what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, and all of these things. So that's, uh, um, that's the, 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 the kind of pair. Okay? So the, the, the basic antidote to those, of course, is to be in the present moment. Right? Uh, and to uh, keep on reapplying the mind in the present moment. And so this is why in meditation we want to... We want to might have uh, a basis, especially in physical sensation. So this is why the, that what they call kaigata sati, or mindfulness of the body, is absolutely critical to any kind of meditation. Okay, especially in the foundations of meditation, the mindfulness. Actually, what's going on in the body? Because the body and the body sensations are all happening in the present moment. Okay, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch are all happening in the present moment. They're not happening in the past, they're not happening in the future. So the more you pay attention to the physical feelings inside your body, then that every time you do that, you're not paying attention to the past, you're not paying attention to the future. You're just paying attention to that present moment. So this is really critical to uh, overcoming this sense of, of restlessness and remorse. Now, if, uh, if this hindrance is... Um, uh, it's just sort of happening on a normal level, right? So it's just ordinary restlessness and, and movement of the mind and so on. Then that's all you need to do, okay? You just keep on developing your meditation object and keep on reapplying your mind to that in the present moment. And there's no other special things you need to do. But if uh, those things are really worrying you a lot, they're really kind of tearing you up a lot, then maybe you need to do something else. So, for example, if you have... Uh, persistent sense of remorse and guilt, you might think, okay, okay, over something that you've done, then you need, maybe you think, okay, I need to do something about that, I need to fix that up. Maybe I need to find that person and ask forgiveness from them. Okay? You're worried about something that's gone on in some relationship or something. Maybe I need to actually fix that up. Yeah? Okay? Or maybe um, I need to pay back the government that, my, that social security money <laughs> that I've been thinking of. Or, uh, Whatever it might be that's actually causing you the problem, you need to actually go and fix that, uh, fix that up. And similarly with the, 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 the restlessness in the future, yeah? the fears of the future. Okay, so maybe, you, you know, maybe you're worried about something. Maybe you think, he's going to leave me. Yeah? What's it, what's, what am I going to do? Yeah? My mum's going to die. What, what, what's going to happen? Yeah? Uh, my, my son is, gonna, is failing university. Yeah? What am I going to do? Yeah? So all these things, and, 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 and so this is, the, these things are uh, sort of coming and they're haunting you in your meditation. Now, s now, sometimes you can do something about that. I mean, with things that are in the past, it's obviously different, but things are happening in the future. Maybe it's sometimes there's something you can do. Right? And so if you find these things are co constantly coming back and, and haunting you, then you say to yourself, well, is there anything I can do about that? And if there is, okay, then you say, okay, I'll do that. If there isn't, 
then you need to say to yourself, there's nothing I can do. That's all. I've done everything I can reasonably do for that. And now I just have to let the future take care of itself. So, so one thing, if that, again, if that is, keeps on worrying you, you can then do some uh, contemplation of impermanence. Yeah? Just the impermanence of things. Everything changes. Nothing's going to turn out the way you expect it to anyway. Yeah? And uh, life is so filled with uncertainties yeah, that you know, any kind of worrying about the future is, is, is really premature. It really doesn't, have, doesn't serve much of a purpose. So, so sometimes you just need to reflect like this. So you reflect on the uncertainty and the impermanence of life, and then that will help you to calm you down and to not be so worried about it. Okay? And so then just come back to your meditation object again. And then the last one is doubt. Uh, so doubt uh, here is, is really doubt about the teaching, doubt about the uh, meditation. Is this meditation any good? Am I practicing the right way? Yeah? Uh, or doubt about yourself. You think, okay, I, 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 I can't do this. Yeah? I, I'm, 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 I'm not, this is not for me. I, I'm, I'm, I don't have enough merit or I'm, I'm, just, I'm just too scattered. I'm too confused whatever it might be. So uh, you, you're sort of lacking faith in those things. So uh, the, 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 the primary uh, cure for doubt in Buddhism is inquiry. Okay? Inquiry. And through asking questions and inquiring then you, you overcome your doubts. Okay? So for example, let's say you know, one of the common doubts is that we doubt about our own capacity. We think, well, I, I can't do this. And this is something I hear from people a lot. You know, that, that they, they lack their own, their own kind of sense of self-worth or self-confidence. And so just inquire into yourself about these things. You think, okay, what is it that I can't do? Okay, so maybe you just say, well, let's take these five hindrances. Okay, now, five hindrances, then can I recognize those things in myself? We can go through them all, one, two, three, four, five, okay? I can see them and feel what they feel like and know what they're like. Right? This is what the Buddha talked about. And so he tells you something, okay? This is what the Buddha taught. He taught these five hindrances. They're here. <laughs> right? It's not a fantasy. He's not talking about some kind of different psychology that doesn't apply to me. He was talking about something real, which is actually in me, and I can feel these five hindrances. Okay, what else did the Buddha say? The Buddha said that these five hindrances are conditioned. And they're impermanent. Okay, is that true? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, it is true actually. You reflect. Well, sometimes I feel a sense of desire. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I feel anger. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I feel tired. Sometimes I don't. So these things are all impermanent. Yeah. So because they're impermanent, does, does, does that mean that I'm that I'm I'm, I'm I'm going to be trapped in them forever? And then you realize, oh, actually, well, of course, that can't be the case. These hindrances cannot last forever. Right? They're conditioned. And so you reflect on that. Well, what's the condition for overcoming them? Okay? So well, the condition for overcoming uh, sensual desire okay, is contentment. Yeah? Do I have contentment? And you say, well, yeah, actually I do have contentment sometimes. Yeah? There, are, there are moments when I feel joy at giving up. Yeah? There are times when I feel joy at sharing and helping with others. Yeah? Oh, that, that's a quality that's in me. Not just the hindrances found in me, but the opposite to the hindrance is also found in me. Yeah? The same with ill will. Maybe I feel angry sometimes, but I, do I also feel love? Do I feel compassion? Do I feel kindness? And you say, oh, okay, those things are also in me. Yeah? And so this is the overcoming of those things. And so if you reflect like that, inquiring, you, 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 you're reminding yourself that this teaching, this Dhamma, which the Buddha taught, is real. It's true. It's not a myth. It is real. These five hindrances are real. The overcoming of the five hindrances are real. And it's something I can see inside myself. And if you can see those things inside yourself, through your own wisdom, your own understanding, then that will... Your, your doubts will be overcome through that investigation. So this is the main reason for overcoming doubt in Buddhism, the main way for overcoming doubt. So 
again, the, these five hindrances, uh, the Buddha said that, that when you're freed from the five hindrances, he said, he, he gave uh, many lovely similes for them. He said, he said like, the one beautiful simile was the simile of a bowl of water. And he said that the, each, each hindrance is like a particular uh, quality in, in the water. So uh, sensual desire is like if you put a bright red dye or blue dye or purple dye in the water. Yeah? So it's very bright and, and beautiful. Yeah? The water looks really beautiful, but you can't see anything through it. Yeah? And anger is like if you boil the water. Yeah? So it's bubbling in that. Yeah? And so again, you can't, you can't, see, you can't you actually see it. There's no clarity in the water at all. Uh, lethargy and drowsiness is like if the water is. Um, I'm just trying to think of the. Uh, just getting these similes straight in my mind. The lethargy and drowsiness is like if the water is uh, in a stagnant pond and it's overgrown, it's got moss and kind of slime and weeds and stuff growing through it, yeah? and there's no. It's sluggish, there's nothing moving there. And uh, restlessness and remorse is like water which is whipped up by a storm. Yeah? And so whipped up by a strong wind. So again, you can't see anything because the surface is all disturbed. And then doubt is like water which is placed in the darkness. Yeah? You can't see through the water because there's no, there's no light in there. So uh, freedom from the hindrances is like the opposite from those things. Yeah? It's like water which is clear, which is undisturbed, which is cool, which is placed in a bright spot and bright sunlight. And so you can see very clearly through the water. This is one very beautiful set of similes the Buddha gave for the hindrances. And another one which is uh, often given was he uh, compared it, the overcoming the hindrances to being freed from prison. Yeah? He, to being freed from an illness. You know, you've been sick and then the illness goes away and then you're able to get up and go about your work. Or being like freed from debt. Yeah? So you, you've been in debt, and then you've been freed from the debt, and you feel happiness and joy. Uh, or being um, released from servitude, like you've been a slave, and you're released from that. So all of these ideas, like these hindrances, of freedom from is a, is a release from something. Yeah? And the critical thing there, the really the important point is that that release from those things isn't anything in itself. Okay. So the state, for example, of being... Uh, let out of jail, okay, is nothing in itself. Right? The, the, uh, you might have a dozen people get let out of jail. Each one of them will go and do a different thing. There's no one experience which they share, which you can say this is the essence of being out of jail. Yeah? But it's simply the, the, the freedom from that state of imprisonment is what we call that. And similarly, freedom from illness. Yeah? We all know what it's like to be sick. Yeah? But what we, our experience of health is all, is all different. There's no one thing which we can pin down and say, well, our experience of being healthy is like this. Yeah? So it's not anything which you can pin down in one particular way, but it's the freedom from that thing which is causing us suffering. So all of the freedom from these five hindrances is freedom from all of these things. And when we can experience that, yeah, it's one of the... It will be... when sorry, I shouldn't say if we can experience When you experience that, Right? When you develop your meditation and you overcome the hindrances and you experience the abandoning of the hindrances, that will be the most profound moment in your life up to that point. Okay? That will be an overwhelming sense of joy, of light, of release, of peace. And it will be something you will never forget. Okay? You will never forget that. And you will realize how much you have been a slave to your own mind. You have been a slave to these hindrances. And when abandoning those hindrances, you're abandoning something which you've known all your life, which have been part of your mind all your life. But losing them, you're not losing anything. Losing them feels like coming home. Even though you've never known that before in your life, it's like coming home. Your mind feels like it should do. You feel, oh, this is what, this is how the mind is meant to work. Yeah, it's like it's like you've 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 
uh, you've serviced your car and you've repaired it and you've got it working, but it never was working beforehand. Now it's working properly and you never knew what that working properly was. That's what the natural state of the mind is. That's what the ordinary mind is, is a mind without the hindrances. And then you'll see and you'll understand what the Buddha said when he said these hindrances are obstructions to wisdom. Because at that time, there'll be a clarity and a power and a steadiness in your ability to know things. Whatever you turn your mind to, and then you'll know that very clearly, and your insight will be strong, your intuition will be strong, your understanding will be strong. Anything you want to do with your mind at that point, you'll be able to do that very well. So this is my talk for this evening on overcoming hindrances. And I offer this to you for your <coughs> reflection. And I'd like to invite any comments or questions.